It's always interesting. Uh, this, the last subject is going to be about self-care. And we always forget about that, and we're busy getting into cars. I know a lot of people are physically packed. They have their things in the car. And a lot of you are probably emotionally packed. <laughs> but I hope you will come back and be present with us for this last presentation. It will be a highlight, I think, for you. You hear that, Jack? <laughs> and Jackie, um, we asked her to talk about self-care, because I think at this time of change, you urgently need to be taking care of yourselves. I know we all put our patients first. That's why I didn't go into the counseling field, because um, I like to put me first, but you all are more self-sacrificing. So, but we have a wonderful presenter. She has her own personal uh, consulting firm. Uh, she's been she's a master trainer for 17 years. She's been in the field much longer, longer than that, and um, she uh, she's been work she's done a lot of work for the Dania Institute, and she's on the road a lot of a lot of the year. And I found it very difficult finally hooking up with her. And I'm really pleased that we finally did and we were able to get her here. The person I'm talking about would be nice for you to know about, wouldn't it? It is Jacqueline Coleman. Now let me introduce you. Jacqueline. support because I, I know folks are filling out evaluation forms. We're reading the paper. <laughs> We're checking out messages. And I'm not calling you out, but I am thanking you firstly for the attention and the support that you gave to Dr. EJ. Is that her name? Ethana. Yes. Um, it was wonderful. I sat in the rear of the room. And I thank you for the support you rendered her. And I want to thank you in advance for the support, for the support that you will give to me as well. Five, four, three, two, ready for takeoff, one. Whenever we start is the right time. Whoever shows are the right people to be here. Whatever happens is meant to be. And when it is over, it is over. I am Jacqueline. I bring you greetings from Washington, D.C., right up the road. I welcome you to Healing the Healer, a fresh start. I, um, I want to first of all acknowledge uh, Linda and the wonderful team at Danya Institute. I thank you for a number of things. Firstly, for the invitation. Secondly, for trusting me. Thirdly, this is not a Western hotel. So why am I thanking you? Well, when I drove up from Washington, I had my instructions and the map quest over to on the seat because I get lost almost everywhere I go besides home. And I checked into the hotel, but I thought I was looking for a Westin. And I pulled up and I says, well, this is a what, you all? What kind double of? Double tree. This is a double tree. But I tell you something. When I laid my body down on that bed last night, it felt like a heavenly bed. <laughs> and Westons are known for heavenly beds. So I thank Danya for the heavenly bed here at the Doubletree Hotel. 
I thank all of you also, as I've said already, for the attention given to the initial speaker, speaker and for all the other speakers before them. You've been here since um, Wednesday, I understand. I promise not to be before you long. I am not a preacher, so that's a promise. <laughs> Um, but I, I do have a few things and insights I want to share with you. I do wear glasses, um, but my vision is the kind where I have to take my glasses off to read what's on the paper, but put my glasses on to read what's there. So I'm going to go back and forth between my glasses off, my glasses on. Secondly is, I will have you know about me, is I make up words. I figure Webster did it. I can do it too. So if I say a word that you don't quite know what it is, just roll with me anyway, as if it is a word. I want to say also um, to all of you that we are indeed uh, partners in a new world. So congratulations on the success of the conference. I want to review with you the objectives for my presentation because you don't have those, you have a description. And for those of us who are evaluators, you know, we always have what? Objectives, don't we? Yeah, now, I'm going to be talking to you all, too. So I don't want you to think, because I don't want to ask you to move. So I'm going to be panning, hopefully, and to you all as well. So my objectives, by the end of our time together, you will hopefully have some level of increased knowledge, skills, and attitudes regarding personal and professional self-care and its relevance. Two, that you will gain insights into the sources of workplace stressors and professional grief. Three, that you will recognize the vital role that managers play in supporting the well-being of staff. Four, that you will learn traditional and some non-traditional strategies and techniques to promote holistic health and enhance wellness. And finally, that you will increase opportunities for future growth and self-development in developing healthier lifestyles. Those are my objectives. So as I begin, I want to share with you, let's see, pardon me one second. I want to say to you all, happy Friday, first of all. Happy payday. How many of us get paid today? Magnificent. Well, you know what? The rest of us that didn't raise our hands, we get paid today, too. Yeah. We get paid today, too. And the final thing is happy hope day. And I love the presentation by the um, initial speaker. But this is, I've read you five objectives, but this is the real objective. It's for me to leave you with some hope, to leave you with hope. Now, a couple of things about me that I would also share is that I'm going to be sharing parts of myself, some of which are a, a little embarrassing, um, but you are worth it. So I'm willing to put myself on the line for you. This is your payday. So I want to first of all uh, share with you that I do own a small consulting company, boutique consulting company. I travel on average two to three times a month. Last month, um, last week I was in Texas, but nevertheless, um, last year I began to notice something when I was in and out of airports. And I would go down through the gates to go to, you know, to, the, to board my uh, plane. And I noticed a lot of people talking to themselves. And I thought to myself, wow, this city has problems, but then I would go to the next city and I would see people talking to themselves. And I'm like, wow, we've got a lot of work to do. Well, you know what was going on, many of you. The Bluetooth was, they were talking into their phones. And I didn't know it because, first admission, I'm not a technologically advanced person. I'm a lad. I don't have an iPhone. I don't use those gadgets. Um, however, so what is my point? My point is I know very little about technology. But what I do know is what I'm here to share with you today. I'm here to share with you about self-care, about relationships, and about being free. 
I do know something about that. And so hence the theme, my theme is embracing self-discovery and, and healing the healer. Now during the course of our time together, I'll be using a lot of I statements. It's not because I'm arrogant, but simply to, for me to share with you that I am with you. I am with you. And so it is as I prepare to walk you through a few nuggets, if you will, I received a Mother's Day card yesterday that I want to share with you. And it says on the front, I can't tell you how thankful I am. On the inside, it says, it's kind of hard to open your mouth when you're grinning from ear to ear. Always love, Judy. Judy dated my card May 9th, 2012. I'll read a portion of it to you because this is my thank you to you as well. Hi, Dr. Jackie. Just sending some love to you. Hope you and yours are well, as always. And she goes on to tell me what's going on in her life. She sends me brochures. She's been asked to be a guest of honor at uh, uh, myfeast.org. For those of you who are local, that's a local Maryland um, agency. And she wrote on the back in her own handwriting, your compassion and kindness and generosity has made such a difference in my life. Thank you. So I wanna say to all of you, while I do not know you, I know you. Thank you for your compassion and your kindness and the generosity that you have made in the difference of your clients, of your partners' lives. Thank you. So, that was my thank you, but here's the other side of the coin. It's the best of times and it's the worst of times. You know the book, so I won't go into the background of the book. However, some of the news flashes during the past week. Upset at the Kentucky Derby. Al, take another, takes the crown. And I think the Preakness is tomorrow, is it? Okay. NBA championships on are uh, all underway, along with hockey and the basketball and baseball, you know, the beat goes on. The games are on. As you all, many of you all know also, the Olympic torch left Greece. It'll be traveling through Greece for about eight days, and then it'll travel in preparation for the games. John Edwards' trial continues. Lotto winner Sue Sun for taking winnings. Despite the fact that Americans spend more on their health care than citizens from 12 other countries, developed nations, a new report finds that more than more does not necessarily equal better when it comes to quality of care. A Colorado ele elementary school student was suspended from school is another news flash last week from singing a lyric from a song, I'm sexy and I know it. I don't know if you all caught this news flash. President Obama forgot the first lady when he departed Air Force One. He had to go back and pick her up. And there is a growing debate, it's a growing debate, many of you all are following it, about what they call attachment parenting. Specifically, mothers breastfeeding their children past two years old four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years old. It's a growing debate. But I'm not going to debate that, nor discuss that, because some in this room believe, as one psychologist said this morning, we're all trying. Those mothers feel that that's in the best interest of their children. So why have I started off this way? Because it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. And so it is a paradox. And I will share with you some lines from the Dalai Lama from the paradox of our age. And he submits that. We have bigger houses for smaller families. More conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, but more problems. We have more medicines, but less health healthiness. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet the new neighbor. 
We built more computers to hold more information to produce more copies than ever, but have less communications. We have become long on quantity, but short on quality. These are times of fast food, but slow digestion. Tall man, but short character. Steep profits, but shallow relationships. It's a time when there is much in the window, but nothing in the room. Now I talked about and thanked the conference organizers for this beautiful heavenly bed that I slept in last night. It, on occasion, it is always, I travel two to three times a month, I always go to the room, put my suitcase down, go look in the restroom, bathroom, powder room, and then I open up the blinds to look at the view. Well, as I looked at the view, it was beautiful. There's a beautiful tree standing outside the window of the room that I need to check out of when I finish this speech. And as I panned to the left, there was a pool. But the pool is empty. The pool is empty. Now, I'm not degrading the double tree with the heavenly bed. But there is an analogy here of an empty pool. There is much in the window, but nothing in the room. Okay? So, I want to speak first to the managers in the room. How many of you all are managers? That's a good number. Okay, some of the rest of you who didn't raise your hand, you are managers too. You just don't know it yet. Okay, so this message is for you. I want to spend some solid quality time with you for a second. On a recent trip to Texas, last week I was in Texas. I boarded the plane at 9 o'clock, plane would land in National at 11 o'clock, and I was thinking, thank God, I'm almost home. The young man sitting beside me wanted to talk. I always ask for a window seat, especially with their two seats on the side. One, the window seat really means for me that I can lean and go to sleep. The young man wanted to talk. He was reading a book by John Maxwell. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. If you are not, that is a key resource that I would leave with all of you all to seek out John Maxwell. He was reading the book. I, put, I settled in and he said, well, how are you, miss? And I says, I'm fine. How are you, sir? Okay. He went on to say that he had been in Atlanta for a conference uh, leadership meeting that his supervisor really should have gone to. Okay. I asked him, well, how was the meeting and how was the book? He said it was excellent. He was superb. He says, but I'm really troubled because my agency, this business, this job I have that I signed on for three months ago, they told me one thing, but now I'm seeing another. He went on to say that the supervisor, the owner is crazy. <laughs> Young man, uh, 26, 27 years old, wealthy family. And I says, wow, so am I. Wealthy family, business handed down to him from his father. He comes into the office two, three days a week. He has a brother appointed to do a major job. Nobody knows what his job is. The COO, the chief operating officer, talks about how bad the, the owner is to everyone in the office. And this young man was troubled. And he went on to tell me his story as I leaned and closed my eyes and he kept right on talking. And he went on to say that, you know, it's just troubling to me. I've worked some superb places, but this is just the worst. It's the worst. But he says, I'm in a bind because I want to get married. And he went on to tell the story about going to the Philippines to meet his fiance's family. I want to bring her over. I said, but when is the wedding? The wedding is at the end of the year. He has to stay on this job in order to be able to bring his lovely bride-to-be over to the U.S. He says, but I have a dilemma. I can stay on the job. I just, I just, I just. What do you think I should do? And I said, well, young man, I just have two questions for you. 
One is, why do you think, first of all, there was three questions. One I asked them is, how many other managers are there in your company? He says, oh, there are lots. So I said, well, why do you think that the owner asked you to come then? He says, he says that he likes me. I said, well, do you think that that might be a small possibility that you could be the answer? to beginning to help turn this organization or this business around. And he said, well, I'm not gonna be here long enough for all of that. I'm not gonna be here for all of that. I don't know, he's stupid, he's crazy, and he's dogging people, and I don't know, what do you think I should do? I leaned over, and I closed my eyes, and I let that young man talk to himself. So, what is it that I'm really, which is why I'm sharing the story with you. I asked him two questions. I really wanted to go to sleep, but sometimes the universe can knock on you and say, this is a moment when someone needs you. I asked, I think, the most pertinent questions to the managers in the room. And I'm sure, I'm sure, you are not working. You are not working. You are not working in terrible situations back at home. However, I ask you, are you working to be a part of the solution in your organization? That is really one of the only questions. It's a beginning question. And I will stop there and listen. So, the major lesson learned, I'll share also um, the earlier speaker talked about the dentist, about the calls. Well, I'm a witness, but I'm also a witness. I love my dentist because I have one rule, no pain. <laughs> that is my rule, no pain. Okay, I've been going to my dentist now for about 10, 15 years. Well, this last trip, which was last month, before I got on the plane to go to Florida, we had a situation. And they explained to me, and many of you may know, because I know you're getting good dental care. They explained to me the difference between an overlay and a root canal. So I said, well, I don't know about all that, but the overlay sounds a lot better because I had experienced the root canal. And they explained to me that when decay gets down deep in the tooth, that the dentist can even try to save it with your help with an overlay. But even if they put an overlay on, you still got to do what? You still got to do maintenance. And I thought to myself, teachable moment, it is the same in our organizations. When there is decay, discourse, that is decay. And if we try to do topical level, going to the Safeway or going to the, the CVS, the 24-hour CVS, and getting some of that oral gel that you just put on top, you're not getting to the decay. And you may say, well, Jacqueline, I'm just a... I'm just a manager, or I'm just the, the, the practitioner, I'm just the counselor, I'm just the clinician. I don't have anything to do with all of that. I will submit to you, you do, because you're part of the maintenance of the organization. And in the event that this is not your area of expertise, I'll let you off the hook, and I will submit to you, then look for somebody like me. Look for someone who can help you. We're called change agents, change managers. And what we do is we help you come in and we help come in to, be, to promote some healing to help deal with the decay. So again, I'm applauding you for the work you do, um, but good managers are watching out for the decay within the organization. My nephew loves to tell the story 
Every time I see him, he tells me this story. He says, Jack, and by the way, people call me Jackie, they call me Jay, they call me Jacqueline, they call me Dr. J, you can call me anything you want, I'm fine with it. And I'm also fine if you misspell my name. Small things for me. But anyway, my nephew's name is Juan. And he says, Jack, did you hear the story about the young man, he was a student in a class, who had an assignment, his teacher gave the class an assignment, and say you were to come back to school the next day and do teach and tell and tell us what you want to be when you grow up. Well, all the other students did theirs. I remember when I did mine, I took my father to school. But this little boy got up and said, the teacher says, well, Johnny, what do you want to be? Give us your presentation. Johnny went to the microphone and says, when I grow up, I want to be happy. Where the teacher says, well, you didn't understand the assignment. Johnny says, I want to be happy. She followed, you don't understand the assignment. Johnny says, no, I don't think you understand life. Johnny was a smart one, wasn't he? But here is something that I will share with you. Again, I'm still talking to managers. In many ways, the crisis in business or the crisis in our workplaces is a crisis of healing. People aren't sure of themselves because they no longer understand the why behind the what. They no longer have the sense that things are well defined and that hard work will lead to success. More and more, people have feelings of doubt and uncertainty about the future of their organizations and the futures of their jobs. This is a crisis of meaning. Those who would aspire to leadership and management positions <laughs> must understand this new environment and must not underestimate the depth of the human need for meaning. It is the fundament, fundamental, most important human craving and appetite that will not go away. So with that then, what is a manager and what's the difference between a manager and a leader? Well, that's another workshop. But I will say to you that leaders and managers are stewards of organizational performance. They either inspire or demoralize others around them and others in the organization. They are responsible for helping to mobilize, to focus, to invest, and to renew the collective energy of those they lead. So, where does the self-care come into all of this? Because managing is hard work. So here are a couple of tips. If you are a manager, I submit to you to do the following. Take a deep breath. Take a real deep breath. Think positive about the work you're doing and about the people that you lead and the people you manage. Do some fun things and learn how to laugh. Exercise and eat nutritionally. Talk with someone. Relax and chill out. And in fact, you can begin to relax and chill out once I take my seat. Because after that, you get your certificates and you can be on your way to start your wonderful holiday weekend. You could turn off the phones too if you want to. Forgive yourselves and others. Let anger out. Just not in the workplace, don't let it out there. But figure out ways to unveil and unleash your energy. Let go and let spirit. I have a manager's test I want to give you also, but I'm going to move on with time so that we can honor our time together. Next, I want to speak to the women in the room for a second. How many of the women in the room are mothers? Raise your hand. Magnificent. Happy Mother's Day. Here's what I want to suggest to you. Wayne Dyer, and I'm not sure if any of you read him, but write that down. Wayne Dyer, D-W-Y-E-R. I love him, I follow him, uh, but he had this to say. He did a recent uh, research study. Um, and by the way, who is he? He's a motivational speaker and psychologist. He's written a lot of books. I haven't written my first one yet, uh, but I do follow some of what he says. But anyway, he did a survey about what women value, okay? And he says that women value, according to research, family number one, sense of independence, career, fitting in and attractiveness, pleasing everyone else. Yet, he notes, 
that after what he calls quantum moments, women's priorities shift. And they shift to, they shift to prioritizing their own growth, prioritizing their sense of self-esteem, they shift to happiness, they shift to forgiveness, and they shift to spiritual awakening. And so it is in honor of spiritual awakening, I want to share this with the women in the room. Twelve symptoms of spiritual awakening. One, an increased tendency to let things happen rather than to make them happen. Frequent attacks of smiling. People oftentimes ask me, why are you frowning? And I think to myself, I'm not frowning. I do have a frown mark, but it's hereditary, along with a little bit of worrying that I did in my younger days. But basically, I'm smiling. Feelings of being connected with others in nature. Frequent overwhelming episodes of appreciation. A tendency to think and act spontaneously rather than from fears based on past experience. An unmistakable ability to enjoy each moment. A loss of ability to worry. A loss of interest in conflict. A loss of interest in interpreting the actions of others. A loss of interest in judging others. A loss of interest in judging ourselves. And gaining the ability to love without expecting anything. So to the women in the room, our path to self-care, I think begins with learning to love ourselves, learning to love our hips, learning to love our hair, and I think many of the women in the room may know exactly what I'm talking about. We're not perfect hourglass figures. And trust me, as I stand here, I would bring no message here that I don't believe in myself. I have issues with my own body. I have small legs. You know, and in America, you're supposed to have a small beauty, small waist, large hips, big legs. I'll stop there. You know what? American society looks for. Went to the women in the room, give it up and love yourself. Love who you are in the body you have. Learn yourself and love yourself holistically. Last week when I was in Texas, a group of women were having a conversation. Um, I could hear it. In fact, it was right there in my face. I was just preparing for my workshop and they were talking. And there were fans going off all over the room, and it was cold in the room to me. So I was like, well, do we need all these fans? And the women in the room know where I'm going, possibly, and some of the men. Where the women said, well, one woman said, well, yeah, I need, I need the fans now. I'm having these private summers. And she went on to talk about how mean she had become. And she said that the doctor wanted to give her some medicine, some synthetics, and she wanted natural. Why am I bringing it up? Because the day will come, ladies, when we need some help. That sometimes being angry at the world is not that anyone did anything to you, it's that you've been given the gift of life. And that seasons come. Our bodies change, things drop, things lift. <laughs> and things happen inside. And we need to get some care. Don't take it out on the people in the job because you're going through a personal summer that's never ending. <laughs> because for other people, it is H E. Go get some pills, <laughs> some natural pills. Change your diet, exercise, move that energy, move that energy. I'm a Reiki master, go get some, go get some healing. 
Move those toxins out of your body. Free yourself. That's what I'm asking for the sisters. So I dealt with the hair, the figure. <laughs> Learn to love your heart and your soul. Deal with your unmet need. I hear a man in the, in the back talking about his wife and marriage. Hold up now. Because guess what? I'm coming to you next. To the men in the room. To the men in the room. I want to see the men. I have my glasses. So all the men in the room, raise your hand. The men in the room. I don't see. There you go. Did you raise your hand over here? To the men in the room. I love you. When I get on a when I get on a plane, you know how women often do. And I'm not picking on women. I sit up front. I'm using I statements. When I get on a plane, and you got this load, you know what I mean? This roller board that you should have checked, but you don't want to pay the fifty dollars because in my bubble, it's fifty dollars is another pair of shoes. <laughs> So we take it on board, but, but, but we can't get it up. I love when a man says, let me help you with that. And you know what I said, ladies, you have to be ready with this one. Oh, you have to say, oh, I just love men. Thank God for men. So here's my moment, and I'm so real. I just love men. But here's what I want to say to you, you gorgeous, awesome, handsome men. I don't know if, I don't know by numbers if you're the minority in the room, but oftentimes you are the minority in the workplace. We don't have, in a helping industry in particular, oftentimes men are outnumbered by women. However, I want to say to you, and I want to acknowledge you because as the song goes, it is a man's world. It is a man's world. So self-care is important for you as well. Now, I'm noting that Junior Sale, Junior Sale, someone in the back went, mm. For those of us who are not following this, and this is the other thing, I'm a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader in high school. I was a cheerleader all my life. Junior Sale, is a world-renowned football player. He played for the Chargers, right? San Diego? Yeah, San Diego, he played for several, but San Diego was home for him. Well, he transitioned, I think it was last week or week before that. Now, I use the word transition. The media say he died from suicide. I say transition. The media said suicide. The only reason why I'm making a distinction is because I don't know if they proved that. They went on to say no note was left. I don't know, but what I do know is Julia Sayo is gone. And his mother is in pain. And here's the issue, gentlemen. Julia Sayo wasn't the first one. He was one of many. So, so of course, there are others who who uh, committed suicide, other football players in particular, they're drawing uh, connections between that and um, head trauma. I don't know about that, but as they interviewed, you know, trophy, you know, football ring win champions, oh, I didn't know my brother was sick. Oh, I didn't know my brother. I just saw my brother. I didn't know my brother was in this shape. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, I'm going to say the same thing to you, brothers. Let it out. And, and I was very clear in my preparation for my time here. I'm not coming here to impress you. I am with you. So I did my homework because I said, how can I stand before a group of men and talk to the men in a way that they could hear me. So I called a couple of my brothers who work in the, in the field, work in the industry, and I said, what do you, what is your advice to the brothers? And they said, number one, machismo. 
to tell the men, sure you're strong, but you don't have to be strong always, all the time. Because you hurt too. You need self-care too. And they told me, and you too need to go to the doctor. Am I making sense? Okay, I want to also say to the men, oh, let me tell you about what Wayne Dyer says about you. In terms of what you back. Someone said, okay. Wealth, adventure, achievement, respect, and of course you know it's on the list. I'm going to go back and be the first one before I give you the fifth one. Wealth, adventure, achievement, respect, and the P word. The P word. What do you think the P word is? It's not going to be testing me in front of all these people. Pleasure. Pleasure. But after the quantum moment, men shift their priorities. And that's probably the man in the room say, I didn't shift that. <laughs> peace becomes number one. I want peace. Two is family. Three is connection to purpose. And four is honesty. So it is all right to be honest by taking a moment to look in the mirror beyond your muscle and your six pack. A six pack is still in there. It might be hot a little bit. But you can, you also need to deal with your mental, physical, and psychological self. And you need to also ask for help. I don't know how many of you all watch Oprah. She has sold Sunday. And last week, if you saw it, the Dama brothers were on. Brothers in prison um, who practitioners were taking them um, into a yoga experience. But one brother said, I am, I'm sorry, I thought my biggest fear was growing, um, growing old and dying in prison. In truth, my biggest fear was growing old and not knowing myself. So, that's my check-in with men. You can know yourself, let go of the physical and sexual machismo, take the stigma off of asking for help, and do what the lines were in a famous movie that I won't call the name of the movie, but you'll know it when I say the lines. Go to your highest point. You jump, I jump. I've got you, I won't let go. Take a deep breath. When I say, do not let go of my hand, we're going to make it. Trust me. Keep swimming. Keep swimming, Rose. And promise me, you will never give up. Make me the promise. So I would say to the men in the room, whatever partners you have, whatever partners you have at home, whatever partners you have in the workplace, if you will allow us we will hold your hand and we will listen. We will listen. So I'm about halfway through my point. I want to turn to part two. Part two is I want to take you to a mountaintop experience. In the Swiss Alps, there is a mountain uh, for a one day journey. Um, and a one-day journey starts at sunrise and ends at sunset. Where halfway there, there's a house called Halfway House. Freezing, cold, and worn out, many of the, um, the climbers get a chance to stop there, change their clothes, take a shower, get a bite to eat, get some hot chocolate, redress to finish the climb. Well, you can imagine what happens after a couple of hours when the ring bell, the first ring means it's time to suit up and go back out to finish the climb. Well, many of you all probably know what happens. What will you do? Many people decide to do what? I'm staying by this fire right now. And in fact, you could bring me a little something, something to put in this tea. 
But the other climbers go out in the freezing cold, sometimes rain, to finish the climb. Well, the story goes that around 4 or 5 p.m., there's another bell that rings. At that point, the people in the house go out on the balcony and they look way up and they see the people who finished the climb waving their hands. They finished. They finished. And they say that legend says that then in a halfway house, everything gets quiet and pensive because those who remain behind, who stopped halfway, realize that they didn't finish for whatever reason. They're happy for those who finished the climb and made it to the top, but they're sad because they gave up. So I'm saying to all of you, in your quest for self-reflection and self-healing, don't give up and don't stop halfway there. Don't stay in the halfway house. Many of us need rest, and the rest really looks like a vacation. For others of us, the rest might be a good massage and a good meal. For others, it might be turn the phone off. Whatever it is, don't stop and stay in the halfway house. So, ABCs for how to get back to the top. A is attitude. There's a famous saying that attitude determines our altitude, and I want to reframe it by saying that attitude determines our magnitude. Magnitude for me is about a vision because it represents depthness and width and stretching. To choose not to scream what we really want to do like those little kids in the grocery stores and throw ourselves down on the floor and scream and holler and cry. There is nothing worse than a grown person, man or woman, having a temper tantrum. So we have to watch the attitude. Okay? Second thing is be loyal. I don't know if you all have followed this, but in 1924, and the setting is Tokyo, there was a professor in the agricultural department at a school who had a dog. And during his owner's life, the dog would greet his owner every day at the end of the day at the nearby subway station. Where the pair continued their daily routine until a couple of years later when the professor did not return. The professor had suffered um, a hemorrhage and he died. However, his dog, his lawyer dog, continued to come back to the same spot they report for over 10 to 15 years, looking for his owner, looking for the owner. And others who saw this happen over the years fed the dog who showed up precisely at the same time every day looking for his owner. owner. So what's the more to the story? The more is that we must find the spark again in the halfway house of recommitting ourselves to, of course, to behavior, health, and wellness but we have to be loyal also to ourselves and to our own dreams. Again, as I said, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. C is, for me, is confidence. One major thing that you will find in a lot of um, leaders is the confidence that they exude. And I want to add confidence to confidence. I want to add courage. And I will submit to you that a warrior's courage is, not, is, is your lifeline to freedom. Can you imagine being so confident that you feel free to just be who you are? So C is a double, confidence and courage. D is develop a win-win attitude. And I'm getting very close to the end now. Develop a win-win attitude. Last night, as the story goes, last night was the last game for my eight-year-old son's soccer team. It was the final quarter. The score was two to one. My son's team was in the lead. Parents encircled the field offering encouragement. With less than 10 seconds remaining, the ball had rolled out in front of my son's teammate. His name was Mikey O'Donnell. With shouts of kick it, kick it, Mikey, kick it, echoing across the field, Mikey reared back and gave it everything he had. All around 
him erupted in screams and shouts. O'Donnell, Mikey, had scored. But then there was a silence, like the one in this room. Mikey had scored all right, but he had scored in the wrong goal, ending the game in a tie. For a moment, there was a total hush. You see, Mikey has Down syndrome. And for him, there is no such thing as a wrong goal. All goals are celebrated by a joyous hug from Mikey. He had even been known to hug the opposing team's um, players. But the silence was broken when Mikey, his face filled with joy, grabbed my son, hugged him, and yelled, I scored, I scored. Everybody won, everybody won. For a moment, I held my breath. This is a father, a man. For a moment, I held my breath, not sure what my son would say. But he said, I need not worry. I watched through tears as my son threw up his hand in a classic high five and started shouting, way to go, Mikey, way to go, Mikey. Everybody won. Later that night, when my daughter asked me who won, I smiled and I replied, it was a tie. Everybody won. So what's my analysis? My brief analysis as I hold this trophy is that we have got to set up situations in our lives right now, right now, where you hold that trophy of success. And it's got to happen every day. Because when you go to work doing care services, I was trained in psychology, personally, I was trained in psychology, uh, worked on a couple of degrees in that, then I went over to work on a doctorate in management, and I surmised that I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be about the business of healing. As, as I'm in the business of healing, you've got to hold up a trophy for yourself. The work is not easy. You are emptying every day. You've got to be your number one cheerleader. E is, on my paper says emotional intelligence. E is, though I'm changing that as of last night in that heavenly bed, E is in the day with gratitude. And I do that. I run list in my mind. You all do too. In the day with gratitude. What worked, what you loved about the day, what you didn't love about the day, and then let it go. Because you can't do anything about it. Okay? F is focus. I have another short story here, and I'm within 10 minutes of ending. F is for focus, another short story. A Native American man was in Times Square in New York City. I'm going to be in New York next week, so I'm going to try this. Surrounded by thousands of people. Everybody hustling. Times Square. If you've been there, it's a hustle. He turned to his colleague and asked him if he heard it. His friend asked in response, heard what? His friend seemed perplexed when the Native American man said back to him, did you hear the beetle? He then continued to urge his friend to listen more closely as he pointed to a, a bridge and traveled there. Once in place, the native man bent over and peeped underneath some brush, and he took the beetle in his hands. His friend asked in astonishment, how did you know that was here? How did you hear that? The native man responded that he was trained to listen, that it is one of the greatest arts and gifts to human man. And so the story relates to us and I have a speech that I call Respect the Hustle, Honor the Flow. We've got to also listen. We've got to listen to our bodies, we've got to listen to our minds, and we've got to listen to our hearts. Because as you all know, as well as me, there are younger and younger folks who are transitioning from heart attacks. People are going to work, and I'm getting messages on my phone. Oh my God, such and such has transitioned from a heart attack, a heart something, a hurt heart. We've got to learn to listen to our bodies. We've got to slow down. 
And we just got to enjoy. And so, another movie as I prepare to come down off of my high. Another famous movie, and you all may remember these lines, where Russell Crowe, sitting on the top of his horse, looked over the troops as they prepared to go into battle. And he raised up his hand and he said, strength and honor, strength and honor. And that's what I will say to you is strength and honor, strength and honor. I have uh, other overheads. Let me get through this real quickly. The halfway house. I wanted to share this with you in terms of the halfway house. Which step have you reached today? This is what I want you to take back with you as you drive back home to spend a lovely self-care, just a do you weekend. The first step is, as you can see on the bottom, I won't do it. The second step is, I can't do it. The third is, I want to do it though. The fourth is, how do I do it? And I'm gonna finish the steps, but I can't do it. Some of us have tapes planted in our minds. I'm, I'm 55 years old, I can't go back to school. Others are saying, well, you know, I'm in recovery, I can't do that. Whatever the I can't do it is, transition that to how do I do it. Then the next step is, I'll try to do it. The fourth is, I can do it. The next step is, I will do it. And the top is, yes, I did it. That's the mountaintop experience. The next slide is, um, I like this, the little boy going back to the, to the class. I imagine that's the same little boy that told the teacher, you don't understand about life. Well, the math problem, if you can see, is, I'm going to call him Johnny, seven times five is 75. He said, maybe wrong, but it's how I feel. <laughs> and sometimes we just got to have those moments. Let me have my temper tantrum, it's wrong, but it's how I feel. And I'm truly approaching the end, but I want to say this also about research. And research is interesting because depending upon who the researcher is, we know we can all maneuver and shape data. But research says that the average man uses about 7,000 words a day. Women use about 30,000 words. I meant to have mentioned this when I talked to the women in the room. So, why am I mentioning it now? Because there's another workshop I do, dialogue between the sexes. Men really want to say to some of us women, shut up. <laughs> Just shut up. I talked to my beloved last night after a conference call, it was 10.30, and he said, well, how was your day? I said, it was a little hairy. And I went on to explain all the things I went through yesterday and at the end, he said, okay then, well, I'm sleepy now, good night. <laughs> Which really meant to me he wasn't listening. He really wasn't. And so, to the women in the room, and to all of us if you care to, I love the book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. But personal self-care starts with honoring our relationships and for the women, we may need to use less words. And some of the men are saying, thank you, God, somebody is saying it. And to the men in the room, we may need you to talk to us a little bit more. The eight universal healing principles. Supports well-being and health. And you all know these answers. You know them. It is non-supportive when you have an unbalanced diet. It is non-supporting when you don't exercise. I was at a funeral yesterday. Young man was 33 years old. He was one of those that, as they said in the comments, went too soon. However, when we got in the church, went to, to go to the repast, the repast was on the third floor. You would not believe the number of people waiting for the elevator. We've got to exercise more. We have lost our sense of humor, not having fun, lack of music, lack of touch and love, lack of interest in hobbies, lack of nature, lack of faith and belief in something bigger than us. This comes from Dr. Angelus Arian. On the left hand side is the answer. 
part of the answers. I'm starting with the bottom. The presence of faith and belief in something higher and more important than us. Nature, beauty, and healing. Plant a garden. Plant a garden. Put some water in the pool and splash around. And ladies, put on a swimming suit. Put on a swimming suit. Be courageous and get a two-piece. Remember, we're going to let go of what other people think about us. Interest, hobbies, and creative purpose. Love, touch, and support systems. Music, sonics, and chanting. Daily and weekly exercise and balanced diet. All of these are doable. And we have to be creative. Exercise, well, for those of us who don't like exercise but we love shopping, go to the mall and exercise there. In and out of stores. See how many stores you can go in and out of, in and out. This is some of the best exercise I've ever had. <laughs> so, when you see someone gather their papers, that's a sign. And the sign is, I'm almost done. Here's my final message. I love you. Yeah, I, love you too. I, I need to take you on the road because I have felt you on that wall. I love you too. I felt you. I love you too. You stayed. Love you, sister. You stayed too. I love you all. It's been good energy there. You too. You too. It's been wonderful. So, a message from the Hopi elders. You have been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now we, you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour. And I will say to you all, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. However, we are the answer we've been all waiting for. So here is what I would have you to consider. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know our garden. It is time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other. And do not look outside yourself for the leader. This could be a good time. There is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel that they are being on to, all torn apart and they will suffer greatly. Know the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off toward the middle of the river, keep our eyes open and our heads above the water. See who is there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time of the lonely wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. Whenever we start is the right time. Whoever shows are the right people to be here. Whatever happens is meant to be. And when it is over, it is over. I applaud you for a successful conference. I applaud you for the work you do. I applaud you and say namaste because the higher good person in me is also that person in you. So I've enjoyed our time together. And since you, it appealed to you, I would suggest to you, be kind to yourself and go shopping for a two-piece bathing suit. Thank you very much. <laughs>